Hello, friends. Welcome once again to Bigfoot for Breakfast, home of the mysterious and the macabre, where we hang out in the studio every week challenging conventional thought. We are your hosts, Samantha Carter and Sarah Jones. We appreciate you so much for joining us once again or joining us this week for the very first time to hear more of the things that you never knew you wanted to know. If you haven't ever done so, please rate and review our show on whichever podcast platform you happen to be listening from. We would appreciate that tremendously. You can add us on Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat for updates and contest announcements also. And if you really want to tell us how you feel, good or bad, you can leave us a voicemail. But mostly Twitter because I am a junkie. Yes, she is. I don't even know how to Twitter. Just call 641-812-2635. You can leave your message. We'll play it on the next episode. Also, you can send us a text message to that number too. So if you're not feeling brave enough to leave a voicemail, which I understand, you can text us. Speaking of voicemails, we have a few this week. You want to play them now, Sam? Yep. All right, here we go. Hey, Bigfoot for breakfast. This is Jason from Vermont. I'm calling because your intro music creeps me out. So I had my friend listen to it. I had to look it up. Apparently, it's the Lincolnshire Poacher number station. And I'm just calling to see if uh, the numbers actually mean anything or not, because it's super weird, and I'm into that stuff. Thanks. See ya. So that was Jason from Vermont. We want to say thank you so much for the voicemail and your encouraging words. And we're really glad that our intro music could do so much to creep you out. And we want to say great job on finding out what it was. We were pretty proud of that when we first implemented the intro music itself. So we thought we were being clever. Most importantly, I love the idea of inspiring other people to do research. I love it. And if you do any research into the Cold War number stations, there are some things in there that will really freak you out. I don't know if you guys have picked up on it, but we're pretty obsessed with the Cold War era (laughs) stuff. And we do have an episode on number stations coming up. Yep, we do. We actually do. We've got one partially written and kind of sitting on the back burner for a little bit, waiting for a rainy day, but we'll get we'll get it in there. It was actually one of the very first episodes that we ever wrote before we even started recording. Don't tell them that because then they'll wonder why the F we are so late every week and why we're not way more ahead and prepared than we should be. Because we're slackers and we've used up all our reserves except for the <laughs> number station. I actually lost the number station episode for a long time and I forgot about it and then we found it not that long ago and I was like oh yeah we should probably include that one because it's pretty cool it really is anyway and we have another one we have another two we have namesake voicemail we do so here is our next hi my name is Samantha I am an avid pet cop podcast <laughs> I got nervous podcast listener um i was moving into my new place last weekend and wanted to listen to something and for some reason i wanted to hear some more about ruby ridge so i found your podcast and started listening from ruby ridge on until i was caught up and then going backwards and catching up on your old episodes it was like i had two friends in my new place with me i absolutely love it you're my new jam i told everybody about it you did the vitamin and benjamin thing i was dying uh, my name is Samantha, and my best friend, sister, name is Sarah, and I love you guys. I'm telling everybody about it. Thanks. Keep up the good work. I feel like we have a friend here, too. you got a friend in me. You've got the worst end of the deal because we're weird. <laughs> yeah, really. It is awesome that you liked our show and that you could feel like we were there with you hanging out. But but can we let like, let's be pen pals. Send us a message. Let's let's be friends for real. She's literally bouncing in her chair. So anyway, Samantha, thank you very much for the voicemail. We really appreciate it. And we're glad that you like the show. And we love being binge listened to. Yeah, that sounds great. Right. Can I binge listen you? Uh, Yeah, please do. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to our last but not least voicemail. We're going to do some in-depth research into the next topic. Yeah, this next suggested topic. So thank you, Brad. Brad. We knew it was you the whole time. You liar. Right when you started talking, I was like, I know this guy. He did okay at disguising his voice to begin with, but he has a very distinguished laugh. And the way he speaks. There's something about his speech pattern. We've already got you figured out. You can't hide from us now. You can't hide from us ever. Hey, this is Chuck Davis out of Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I was wondering if you guys heard the, you know, this cool story. It actually ties into the Men in Black. It's called the Zombie Butts from Uranus. 
Hey, this is Chuck from Omaha. <laughs> Chuck Davis from Omaha. <laughs> so first of all, for the record, I really enjoy our prank calls. Yeah, that was a good one, actually. It really was a good one. Uranus. Grow up, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually like a um, Uranus, Missouri and they have a fudge shop, and the slogan is "The best fudge comes from Uranus." And it's on my list of road trip, like road trips that need to be taken, so you can get fudge from Uranus. Yes. <laughs> no, you don't. No, I don't. <laughs> his fingers smell like his butt. <laughs> So, in light of current events and politics and the sudden media spotlight on the subject, we've had a lot of people asking, what is Q or QAnon? What is Q indeed? So, we've decided to do a crash course episode and explain the very basics to those who may be curious. According to Q research sources, the number of Google searches related to Q or QAnon are currently at an all-time high. And it's crazy because it's been around for a while, but really people are, it's really getting around at this point. People are really making it a topic of conversation. As far as your basic Google search goes and mainstream media coverage goes, the general consensus is as follows, quote, QAnon is a far-right extremist conspiracy theory which alleges that there is a secret plot by a supposed deep state against President Donald Trump and his supporters. I like how you said deep state. You have to deep state. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So according to these MSM sources, no part of the theory has been shown to be based in fact. We've discussed our stance on wearing the title conspiracy theorist in previous previous episodes. And as I've said before, I'll wear the tinfoil hat now and again. But we do make a point to do the research and not just take the theory as a whole as fact in most cases. And as to the claim that none of it seems to be based on fact, that is not true. It's false. There are claims where there is no fact, and I will say that, but there are some little tidbits of truth to some of these theories. And it's really funny. I'm not trying to come off bias right from the get-go because I'm not really. But the fact that immediately when you look up any kind of explanation for QAnon and you get into like a mainstream definition or from Google, you know, something of that sort, they're immediately pushing that this is a conspiracy theory agenda. They seem to be pushing you within their definition even to believe that it's crazy. There's nothing based in fact. Nothing to see here, folks. And I'm not saying that I 100% follow the whole thing. But, you know, immediately within the definition, it's pushed as false. All of it is false. But when you really start looking into it, it's like, well, not all of this is false. And it really opens your eyes to just, oh, I read about this part of what Q says. Maybe I'll just look into it a little bit. And then you look into it yourself. And then you read about this part of Q and you're like, oh, I'm not sure about that. But it's encouraging you to do your own research piece by piece. They sell it as this large conspiracy theory, which is what I looked for going into it. But really what the base of Q is, is an individual or three or four or a small group of individuals posting small pieces of information. And then from there, the theories, assumptions, conclusions, all that stuff is based on individual researchers. And so we're going to go forward presenting some of these ideas and we want you to just bear that in mind. Yeah, it's not a group of people just telling you what to believe. It's small bits. Encouraging you to do your own research. Hey, look into this. Hey, look into this. And I, I can respect that a little bit. So anyway, while we're not completely sure we believe in the entire thing one way or the other, we do encourage people to keep an open mind because we will too, either way. So what we have found in our digging is that QAnon as a movement falls under a lot of negative review and scrutiny as far as the general population is concerned. But also, a lot of people have no clue at all what they're talking about when they bring it up. So there's that, which is similar to a lot of the other topics we cover. Since our mission here is to provide a mostly non-biased presentation of information to allow you to make your own assessments, we've decided to go on a research mission, yet again, down the ever-winding rabbit hole to offer you a well-rounded picture so that you can decide what you think. And this is indeed the rabbit hole of all rabbit holes, so brace yourself for this wild ride. What I do want you to understand about Q, as far as we have found in our own research, the origin of information, the actual Q post is just drops of information. What the Q followers conclude from this information may or may not be accurate. As with any other movement or theory, there are always extremists. And not to sound too derogatory, but there are the crazies who add their own insane spin on the core information, which just takes away from a lot of the validity of the original information. And that's all I've got to say about that, Jen A. Call me the white rabbit and take this red pill. QAnon has made its mainstream debut in recent months. The most important question is, what is QAnon or who is Q? 
Where is this information coming from? So, it appears that the origin of Q was a post in October of 2017 in which a comment was posted on 4chan. First of all, what the F is 4chan? 4chan, like we said, is an anonymous website launched by Christopher Poole in October of 2003 which hosts discussion boards dedicated to a variety of topics. According to Wikipedia, as of June 2020, 4chan receives more than 22 million unique monthly visitors with approximately 900,000 posts made daily, which gives us a little insight to its size. At the time that he launched the site under the username Moot, Chris Poole was 15 years old. Is much of this information relevant? I don't really know, but the more you know, the more you know, you know? The big question that I want to mount on the dashboard of this exploration bus is, why was so much focus and money and effort being put into the suppression of QAnon groups or followers on social media if it's dismissed as a fringe conspiracy theory? Let's start at the beginning. At this point, Q is considered a team rather than an individual. It is believed that this is a team of people who work very close to the president on a daily basis. The origin of the name Q is that the original posts claim that they are a level Q security clearance, which is a high clearance level issued by the Department of Energy. Nowhere have I found that the source of the post has ever claimed to work for that specific department, though. The QAnon theory does encompass the ideology that there is a deep state working above and beyond the official governing bodies of countries around the globe. This isn't limited to America. This is a worldwide phenomenon, a shadowy civil war with reaches beyond any one country or continent, where we will give credit to this movement is that the followers of Q are encouraged to do research themselves, go see for themselves with their own eyes, doing their own legwork and drawing their own conclusions after following the trail. Regardless of whether we drink the Kool-Aid or not, we do find that respectable. So let's give it a go. Are you ready to start picking up breadcrumbs? You got your hiking shoes on? In this vast winding trail of conspiracy, I have found that the best way to get a good foothold as far as evidence goes is to follow the money. So let's do that. QAnon takes a firm opposition against the Federal Reserve. Why would a conspiracy group have an opinion on our nation's central bank? Here's the facts when it comes to the establishment of the central banking system. In 1791, Alexander Hamilton was the Treasury Secretary of the United States. This year, Congress established the first bank of the United States headquartered in Philadelphia. This would be the largest corporation in the country, dominated by big banking and money interests. Many Americans strongly opposed the idea of a large and powerful bank, and in 1811, when the bank's 20-year charter expired, Congress refused to renew it. In 1911, Senator Nelson Aldrich proposed a plan that was presented to Congress in 1912 after spending a year under review, which called for a National Reserve Association. It sounds like the origin of this plan could be traced to a 1910 secret meeting organized by financiers and bankers. But... Because they were well aware that the public would not welcome a plan crafted in by bankers, they took measures to ensure the meeting was secret, such as using only their first names and attending under the guise of being on a duck hunting trip, according to FederalReserveHistory.org. It sounds like this plan was doomed to fail after Woodrow Wilson won the 1912 election and the Currency Committee's subcommittee was placed under the leadership of Representative Carter Glass, who was tasked with the exploration of other bank bank reform proposals. Glass also did not like the idea of government control, and like Aldrich's plan before his, his plan also surrendered the majority of control to the bankers. President Wilson insisted that the plan needed an oversight agency as he knew the people would not support so little government control. The Federal Reserve Act was signed by President Wilson on December 23rd of 1913. According to QAnon supporters, the Federal Reserve was established illegally and bypassed Congress. By November 16th, 1914, 12 cities that had been chosen as sites for regional reserve banks were up and running, just as Europe had erupted into the First World War. One of the greatest motivations for the establishment of the Federal Reserve was the outrage of so many Americans that the government had previously been bailed out by financier J.P. Morgan. So where the conspiracy comes into play is, based on what we can find, the writings of Eustace Mullins, who was a researcher at the Library of Congress in 1950. Apparently in 1949, Mullins was asked if he had ever heard of the Federal Reserve System. And at that time, 
At the age of 25, he had not. He was presented with a $10 bill marked Federal Reserve Note and asked to do some research at the Library of Congress on the Federal Reserve System, which had issued this bill. Mullins did the research, and he completed a manuscript on his claimed findings. The publishing of that manuscript was rejected by pretty much every publisher in New York, home of the largest of the 12 central banks. Eventually, he was published under the title Mullins on the Federal Reserve, an updated version was then released in the 80s. Among the many revelations in his research, Mullins argued that the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 defies Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 5 of the United States Constitution by creating, quote, central bank of issue, end quote, for the United States. The Fed is unconstitutional, according to their research, because our federal government is one of enumerated powers and nowhere does the Constitution permit the modern practice of monetary policy. Article 1, Paragraph 8, Section 5 reads, The power to coin money and regulate the value thereof has been broadly construed to authorize regulation of every phase of the subject of currency. Congress may charter banks and endow them with the right to issue circulating notes, one, and it may restrain the circulation of notes not issued under its own authority. Two, to this end, it may impose a prohibitive tax upon the circulation of notes of state banks. Three, or of mun municipal corporations. Four, it may require the surrender of gold coin and of gold certificates in exchange for other currency not redeemable in gold. A plaintiff who sought payment for the gold coin and certificates thus surrendered in an amount measured by the higher market value of gold was denied recovery on the ground that he had not proved that he would suffer any actual loss by being compelled to accept an equivalent amount of other currency. 5. Inasmuch as every contract for the payment of money simply is necessarily subject to the constitutional power of the government over the currency, whatever that power might be, and the obligation of the parties is therefore assumed with reference to that power. 6. The Supreme Court sustained the power of Congress to make sure Treasury notes legal tender in satisfaction of antecedent debt. 7. Many years later, to abrogate the clauses in private contracts calling for payment in gold coin, even though such contracts were executed before the legislation was passed. 8. The power to coin money also imports authority to maintain such coinage as medium of exchange at home and to forbid its diversion to other uses by defacement, melting, or exportation. So let's break down the Fed. The central banking system is comprised of 12 banks across the country. The 12 Federal Reserve banks are organized into a corporation whose shares are sold to the commercial banks and thrifts operating within the bank's district. Shareholders elect six of the nine board of directors for their regional, regional Federal Reserve Bank as, as well as its president. According to Mullen's updated report, the top eight New York Fed stockholders in 1983 were Citibank, Chase Manhattan, Morgan Guaranteed Trust, Chemical Bank, Manufacturers Hanover Trust, Bankers Trust Company, National Bank of North America, and Bank of New York. Also, according to this report of Mullins, these banks are owned by about a dozen European banking organizations. And here's where the water gets murky. The most notable of these organizations are the Rothschild Banking Dynasty, which have stake in American financial institutions through the use of American agents. This gives them power over selecting the board of directors for a New York Fed and guides U.S. monetary policy. How does a foreign banking company gain this kind of control? According to ModernHistoryProject.org, in the early 19th century, the Rothschild established a number of affiliates in the U.S. under city banks or city companies, identifying them as originating in the city of London. Remember, Citibank has been among the top banks owning shares in the New York Fed. The Citibank was established in New York in 1812 in the same room in which the Bank of the United States had operated until its charter expired. Citibank was managed by Moses Taylor for 50 years. Taylor's father had been a confidential agent for John Jacob Astor and British intelligence. Moses Taylor, like J.P. Morgan, doubled his fortune in the Panic of 1837 by purchasing stock in the depressed market with capital advanced by N. M. Rothschild of London. Citibank prospered during the Panic while most competitors failed. 
Percy Pine, came from London to work at Citibank and married Taylor's daughter. When Taylor died in 1882, Pine became president of the now National City Bank. John D. Rockefeller's brother, William Rockefeller, invested in the bank and persuaded Pine to step aside in 1891. James Stillman, Rockefeller's associate, then became president of the City Bank. William Rockefeller's son married Stillman's daughter, Elsie, and his other son, Percy, married Stillman's daughter, Isabel. James Stillman's father, Charles Stillman, had London connections as well as he had been a Rothschild agent in Brownsville, Texas, and a successful blockade runner during the Civil War. So there's that. In 1903, Banker's Trust was set up by the eight families. Benjamin Strong of Banker's Trust was the first governor of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. In 1913, the creation of the Fed fused the power of the eight families to the military and diplomatic might of the U.S. government. Morgan, Chase, and Citibank formed an international lending syndicate per QAnon followers. It sounds like when J.P. Morgan bailed out the American government, it was likely with funds secured from the Rothschilds of London. And when he died in 1913, it was found that although he had been rumored to have been worth upwards of $75 million, it was actually closer to $19 million of securities in the entire estate, $7 million of which was owed to an art dealer. J.P. Morgan Jr. had to sell off many of his father's art treasures to pay the debts of the estate. Most of the huge sums handled by J.P. Morgan went directly to the Rothschilds, who are denied to officially have any part of American finance. That being said, strangely, the New York Times noted in its 1905 Five obituary of Baron Alphonse de Rothschild that he possessed some $60 million in American securities. Weird. Weird. So weird. So I know that that's a really confusing information dump, but ultimately what it boils down to is a very crude summary that there are a very small number of families in the world that control and guide the financial state of the world's governing bodies. And so we just kind of wanted to run through that so that we weren't just asking you guys to take our word for it. I wanted to show you and lay out where the familial connections were and where QAnon followers are picking up this information and running with it. So within this conspiracy, the families or bloodlines that quote unquote rule the world are listed as obviously the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, Astors, Bundy, Collins, DuPont, Freeman, Kennedy, Lee, as an L.I., Lee, Onassis, Russell, Van Dyne, Merovingian, respectively. Some of these names you will hear as we go on. Another aspect of the QAnon theory, as it pertains directly to the Federal Reserve, is that J.P. Morgan, who had been a huge proponent of the establishment for the Federal Reserve, found himself at odds with other wealthy financiers and businessmen who did not support the central banking system. One of these men were... Benjamin Guggenheim, who was the son of a wealthy mining magnate. Isidore Strauss, who was a banker, politician, as well as the co-owner of Macy's Department Store. Last but not least, John Jacob Astor, who was a businessman, real estate developer, investor, inventor, writer, lieutenant colonel in the Spanish-American War, and a prominent member of the Astor family. You know, I was just sitting here thinking about romantic comedies. Oh, were you? Are you into chick flicks? Not really. I'm not necessarily partial I prefer action hero movies and fantasy more often than not, but I have this guilty pleasure where I will binge watch Hallmark Christmas movies and other such romance films. I'm not with you on that. I'm especially partial to Leonardo DiCaprio films. I am too, but he's not in those. You're way off the subject. Is there a point? One of my favorite Leo DiCaprio movies is Titanic. Have you seen it? I think everyone in the Western world has seen Titanic. Do you remember the part where Jack goes to the rich people dinner with Rose and she's pointing out all the people of note? <gasps> I know where you're going with this. Remember when she points out John Jacob Astor and states that he's the richest man on the ship and his wife is pregnant and trying to hide it? Yep. Then she points out Benjamin Guggenheim and his mistress stating that his wife is at home? Mm-hmm. Well, interestingly, Isidore Strauss was also on the Titanic. Weird. Each of these men died on April 15, 1912, when the Titanic sank. Isn't it all the men that just opposed the central banking system? Even stranger is who was not on the ship. Hmm, I wonder who wasn't. J.P. Morgan was apparently also supposed to be on the ship, which is verifiable. He had a ticket, but he decided to lengthen his time abroad. He oh. was present for the launch of the Titanic from Belfast on May 31st of 1911. This theory really actually predates QAnon, of course, and the fire is flamed 
as it was suspected that perhaps the Titanic was switched with its sister ship, the Olympic, and sunk intentionally as an insurance scam. A scam that obviously went horribly wrong. A little more gasoline to throw on that flame is that J.P. Morgan's International Mercantile Marine Company owned White Star Line. Others do have a different theory altogether that the ship was sunk to eliminate those three men so that they could move forward with the establishment of the Federal Reserve the very next year. Now, a lot of people will contend that nobody in government or any corporate entity would sink an entire ship just to kill three people. But have you met humans? I've met a lot of humans. They will do things like that. People will do awful things when it comes to money. So I'm not going to discredit that one because I believe humans would do that to other humans when it came to that much money. Especially peasants. (laughs) Yeah, who cares about the peasants? Right. Nobody cares about me. Yeah, we are the peasants. Those who argue that theory state that there is no documentation anywhere that these men outright opposed the Federal Reserve. But we here at Bigfoot for Breakfast love a good conspiracy. And if you tie it together with enough coincidence, it's even more interesting. So to play devil's advocate, we can't find any documentation that they didn't oppose the Federal Reserve at any point either. There is a 1911 New York Times article published on October 25th of that year, the title of which could give credence to the contrary. The title is, quote, Isidore Strauss are used for the recognition of a central association's note as reserve money. So we'll let you draw your own conclusion on that. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. While we're on the topic of theories related to deaths to all who oppose the Federal Reserve, let's talk about another American who proposed a national government-regulated banking system and the issuance of government-legal tender paper currency in opposition of the plan to resell U.S. bonds with the Barrings and the Rothschilds following the Civil War. That's right, y'all. Abraham Mother Effing Lincoln. (laughs) A compromise was made and a national bank was established. The National Bank was required to deposit with the Treasury U.S. bonds worth at least one-third of its capital and would be issued government-printed notes to circulate as currency. The banks could not circulate notes printed by themselves. In another compromise, Hugh McCulloch, who hated Lincoln's new system, was appointed as the comptroller of the currency in March of 1865. The following month, Lincoln was assassinated. That's just another one of those things that make you say, hmm. McCulloch called for the retraction of the notes after that. And with that, a quote. I do not believe in big government, but I believe in effective government. In a government which meets its appropriate responsibilities and meets them effectively. Economic policy can result from governmental inaction as well as governmental action. What you are entitled to hear from me is, why is a change necessary? And what changes would I adopt? I start from the premise that the performance of the Republican Party has been inadequate in at least five areas of economic policy. End quote. End quote. To paraphrase and summarize the gist of this speech and those specific five areas, they are, one, economic growth, two, unemployment, three, recurrent recessions, four, price inflation, and five, finally, there is proper concern about our balance of payments and the recent drain of gold. Quote, I submit that this is not a radical fiscal policy. It's a conservative policy, but we must have a flexible, balanced, and above all, coordinated monetary and fiscal policy. I do not, let me make clear, advocate any changes in the Constitution of the Federal Reserve System. It's important to keep the day-to-day operation of the Federal Reserve removed from political pressures. The president's responsibility, if he is to lead, includes longer-range coordination and a direction of economic policies, subject to our system of checks and balances. And I believe the Federal Reserve Board, which during the last eight years has cooperated closely with this administration, would also cooperate with future strong and well-considered presidential leadership, which expresses the responsible will of Congress and the people." 
quote. This is part of a speech made on October 12th, 1960 by Senator John F. Kennedy at the Biltmore Hotel in New York. Sounds like he also wanted to make some changes in policy to the way that the Fed operated. Weird, so Abraham Lincoln and JFK? What do those two have in common? It's so weird. Anyway, let's not get too crazy. So on June 4th of 1963, Executive Order 11110 was issued by JFK, which delegated to the Secretary of the Treasury the authority to issue silver certificates during the transitional period to eliminate the use of silver certificates and the use of Federal Reserve notes. One theory in regard to this executive order is that Kennedy was trying to rein in the power of the Federal Reserve in opposition of the increasing power of the billionaires, bankers, and power brokers, according to Jim Mars in his book Crossfire among other proponents of Q. Apart from the Federal Reserve, I do encourage you to do some of your own research on looking into the coincidental occurrences in which governments around the world are overthrown, toppled, or restructured, and the new Rothschilds banks are built into those countries. Just throwing that out there. It might be worth a few hours of digging, and then call and tell us what you find, because I don't want to do any more reading right now. So, help a girl out. (laughs) Haha, kidding. Kinda. (laughs) Yeah, we don't want to. You you do it. (laughs) You tell us. Yeah, go ahead and dig into that. So, let's stay on track. Back with the money trail and look at George Soros, who is a huge element of the QAnon conspiracy. I've been waiting to talk about George Soros. I'm sure you can understand why. Who is this guy? We hear his name thrown around all the time and see his face everywhere. So I went to georgesoros.com and according to his website, he was born in Budapest in 1930, is the chair of Soros Fund Management LLC, is one of history's most successful financiers and... His views on investing and economic issues are widely followed, and his philanthropic organization, the Open Society Foundations, supports democracy and human rights in more than 100 countries. Sounds like a downright upstanding guy, right? So why all the negative talk? George Soros moved to the U.S. in the 1950s, and he has a net worth of around $8 billion, last I heard, give or take, I think. The Open Society weighs in at about $25 billion in assets. According to a BBC article in the UK, Soros is known as, quote, the man who broke the Bank of England in 1992. It sounds like he and other currency speculators borrowed money and then sold them, driving down the price of sterling on currency markets, forcing the UK to crash out of the European exchange rate mechanism. In the process, he made a cool billion and he continued making money from there. According to QAnon supporters, Soros is behind the funding of countless efforts to destabilize and create division and to maintain control. Soros is believed to be a financial donor to organizations like NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, as well as paying people to riot and cause destruction and discourse under the guise of civil rights activism, which is, you know, controlled opposition, if you will. Um, We're going to steer clear of that topic, but we did want to throw in there that it is a big part of this all-encompassing conspiracy. It's just that we don't want to necessarily say that that's true for sure, because there's not necessarily a paper trail that we can find. I didn't look for it because I don't want to touch on current hot civil rights topics. Good idea. Period. It's probably just something we should kind of stay away from and stick to the facts. We here at Bigfoot for Breakfast aren't political commentators yet. They'll call us. CNN keeps calling me, but I'm like, bro, nah, bro, (laughs) bro. Let's touch on a different social issue in which cures have firmly fixed their eyes. Child sex trafficking. Yes, this is a very hot topic right now. Let's start with one of the most well-known scandals related to this topic, a pizza-related scandal. I'm sure most of you have already heard the gist of this issue, but for those who haven't, the personal email account of Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, John Podesta, was hacked in March of 2016. WikiLeaks published his emails in November of 2016. Proponents of the pizza-related conspiracy theory claimed the emails contained coded messages connecting high-ranking Democratic Party officials and U.S. restaurants with a human trafficking and child sex ring. One such establishment involved, allegedly, was the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria in Washington, D.C. The theory is, the emails referencing pizza were a code. The phrase, cheese pizza, was connected to pedophiles, who on chat boards using the initials 
CP to denote child pornography. James James Elephantis, the owner of Comet Ping Pong, was mentioned in Clinton's campaign chairman John Podesta's emails as he happens to be a Democratic donor. Elephantis had previously been in a relationship with Clinton ally David Brock, who was going to organize a fundraiser for Clinton's campaign, which is why he was part of the email convo, apparently. Aside from the pizza-related scandal specifically, the child sex trafficking rabbit hole is deep and winding. And all throughout these tunnels, in every direction, you'll find the Clintons. The most obvious link to the sex trade in the Clintons is Bill's name on Jeffrey Epstein's flight logs to Little St. James Island, also referred to as Pedophile Island or Epstein Island, not to mention the painting that Jeffrey Epstein had of Bill Clinton in a blue dress and red high heels, which was weird, and for the record, it does sound like it was bought by Epstein, painted by a college student, and someone modeled for the photo and then Clinton's face was added. Bill didn't actually pose for the painting, or so they say. (laughs) Anyway, everyone I'm sure has seen at least a mention of the stories going around regarding Epstein's private plane flight logs and the Hollywood celebrities or high-level politicians that have been to this island allegedly. There are a lot of versions of this list going around and some have been debunked and I have yet to see any official release of this list, but a lot of allegations have been made. Anyway, another tunnel in this rabbit hole lands in Haiti. In 2010, 33 children from Haiti attempted to cross the Dominican border with Laura Gaylor Sills the vice president of marketing for the company AlertSense, which is the software for Amber Alert. She was working in the capacity of a missionary for New Life Child Refuge. She was transporting the alleged orphan children out of earthquake-devastated Haiti without permission or paperwork. Ultimately, it was found that some of these children had parents and were not orphans at all. She was arrested and charged with kidnapping, and the children were returned to their families, some of whom allegedly stated that they had handed their children over willingly. But for what purpose? What was she going to do with the children? So it does sound like some of the families did come out and say that they sent their children thinking that they were going to end up in America with other families for a better life and that they were supposed to have visitation privileges with their children. All in all, she had no paperwork or any documentation. So these kids were just going to be in the wind. Yeah. Really. I mean, we would have never known what Mm -hmm. happened. You can't do that. So without getting in too deep, this is where the evidence trail takes some towards the idea that this is part of a greater conspiracy. Laura Silsby's legal advisor and spokesperson, Jorge Pueo, was arrested on human trafficking charges, was wanted in Vermont as well as Canada related to the alleged smuggling of illegal immigrants, in Philadelphia for probation violations related to fraud charges, according to U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. On top of that, he faced charges in El Salvador for crimes against children, sexual exploitation of minors for pornography and prostitution, organized crime, and human trafficking, according to a statement made by ICE. So, he seems like exactly the guy I would want as my legal counsel. I was going to say, did she not vet him? August 18th of 2010, he was extradited to the United States and sentenced to 37 months in prison in June of 2011. So what happened to Laura Silsby? She was convicted and served she was. time. Yeah. So here's where the Clintons come into play here. It is a well-documented and researchable fact that Hillary Clinton, U.S. Secretary of State, was asked by Jorge Pueyo's legal representation to personally intervene in the case. That is a fact. Now the question is, why would the U.S. U.S. State Department under Hillary Clinton intervene in a case involving human trafficking, more specifically child trafficking, on behalf of a defendant who had been untruthful about his case. He wasn't even credentialed to practice law in Haiti where he was representing the Americans. Yes, this all sounds like speculated suspicion, but you cannot deny that this is strangely coincidental, especially given that the State Department's policy, according to WikiLeaks email, holds the position that, quote, The United States government respects the sovereign right of the government of Haiti to conduct its own judicial processes, end quote. Why would he appeal to her specifically? One of the claims made by Q researchers that I stumbled across was that the legal services of Jorge Pueyos were paid for by the Clintons in one way or another. I did not manage to confirm this claim. But also, as this is a crash course to give you guys the basics of the Q theory, I didn't dig all that hard. It's easy to get lost in this type of research. The rabbit hole is deep and dark, and I do love breadcrumbs. Carbs? 
are our favorite. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of this information is in, you find it bits and pieces in articles. I know one of the articles that I looked through was like a Miami Herald and then the Jamaican, like a Jamaican newspaper. All the sources that I found are listed. And some of them, like I specify, aren't sourced at all. And it's all speculation based on the Q theory. Yeah, but, but like we're we pretty said. pretty good about saying, yeah. this is said, but not necessarily proven. So one could dismiss this, right? No. Were it not for all of the other arrows pointing right at Secretary Clinton, not only when it comes to the whole child trafficking ring, but scandal in Haiti alone. The Q theory, as I said, is all-encompassing and ties together so many major scandals linking them to the greater cabal. So, it couldn't avoid the discussion regarding undeniable mishandling of funds in Haiti by the Clinton Foundation. So let's open this can of worms, shall we? The Clinton Foundation website, adorned with adorable pictures of Haitian children holding hands and smiling, boasts the raising of $16.4 million immediately following the 2010 earthquake. The claims of scandal and controversy over the foundation's handling of the post-earthquake relief efforts in Haiti are numerous. This includes not only the claim that they promised funding for a hospital that was never delivered, but also that $3 million was rerouted and paid for Chelsea's wedding, which is information that apparently came from an email between a Clinton aide and John Podesta. So that money trail I could not find. I couldn't confirm or find specifically where the money would have came from or that it officially paid for wedding funds, but I'm just throwing it in there because it's part of the conspiracy. It's part of the all-encompassing it's something that's been said but yeah we're not sure it's just part of the theory and we're not trying to sell you on the theory or, or sell the parts of the theory we're just informing you of what the parts of the theory are right Correct. that makes sense we're just reporting on what it is yeah because there are a lot of questions about it so whether the claims are true or not i wouldn't venture to say i will venture to say that a lot of the people who did seem to think the claims were true conveniently for the clintons killed themselves hear me out on this while we were doing research for the episode 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 <laughs> 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 I came across a lot of strange things that I was previously unaware of. Klaus Eberwein was a former Haitian government official who was expected to appear in court to testify to the Clinton Foundation corruption. Unfortunately, a week before he made that appearance, he died in a hotel in Miami with a gunshot wound to the head. According to a Miami Herald article, Eberwein was also a part owner in a pizza restaurant in Haiti. Super weird. If you don't understand why it's weird, just do some digging. Also, I saw this all over Facebook where people bought those LOL dolls. Yes. And, and then you put them underwater on. and they got pizza tattoos and they had really weird lingerie tattooed on them after they were dipped in water. What the F? So people are throwing that shit out right now, right? Yeah. And the same with the troll doll with the giggle button on her hoo-ha. Yeah. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Odd. Weird. No judgment yet, but it is very questionable that children's toys would be made this way. I mean, come on. Another case that was considered to be a so-called smoking gun was Monica Peterson. Here's what I could find. Monica Peterson earned a bachelor's degree in anthropology in 2008, her master's degree in international development with a concentration in human trafficking, and she worked for the Human Trafficking Center. She was also a sex worker advocate. She traveled to Haiti on more than one occasion. Claims were that she was in Haiti in the capacity of investigating sex trafficking. Others deny this claim and state that she was there for an entirely different purpose. She is said to have had disdain for the Clintons and blogged about having looked into the pizza-related scandal. In August of 2015, Monica posted on Facebook a post asking for information on sex trafficking in Haiti because she was heading there to help and investigate. The post was as follows, quote, I'm down in Haiti for the next three weeks doing field work on human trafficking, i.e. all exploited labor sectors, not just sex, but was wondering if anyone knew of any sex work organizations working in Haiti. No sex trafficking saviors, just actual pro-sex worker organizations. I'm a social anthropologist who wants to do solid research on human trafficking. Rescuing people is not in my agenda. This is a stupid and imperialist concept, end quote. You draw your own conclusions on that, but Monica died in Haiti on November 13th of 2016. It sounds like she was said to have died from a hanging prior to the election. So I think basically, if you're not picking up the context, there is a line in the human trafficking issue where 
pro sex work supporters, which I don't have any, you know, whatever, you know, do your thing, live your life if you want, as long as you're doing it by choice, where the people who are 100% gung ho, all sex works is sex trafficking. But she is an advocate for people who have made the choice to be sex workers. And that's how they make their living. And she's trying to advocate for better working conditions for that choice of employment and not necessarily saying that all sex workers are being human trafficked. So that's where she's saying I'm not looking for rescuing. I'm looking for organizations that are helping sex workers. You know what I'm do you understand? Yeah, because she wasn't trying to help them get out because they want to do that work because that's how they make their living and they're fine with it. But she said, well, if this is going to exist and you're doing it willingly, let's advocate for you to have a better work environment and to not have an unregulated situation with bad people controlling your every day. Which I stand by 100%. Yeah, I get that. But the part of this falling into the conspiracy is that perhaps she stumbled upon something in her research that she was opposed to and ultimately ended in her death. Or, or maybe they didn't want her know. regulating things. Maybe exactly. they were doing things, you know, they had, you know, these people who were controlling it had made a bunch of money from it and were paying these people very little and they could do it on the cheap. And the so they didn't is, want her coming in there and like fixing it and making it better and losing them more money. Or who's controlling it and how are they controlling it? And on top of just having the, your standard sex workers, what else was going on that she may have stumbled across. So yep. there's that. I think you asked a key question here. Who was at the top of this situation? And maybe she found out who was at the top. And, you know, that sort of work and organization is okay for some people, but for people who may or not be involved in a high-ranking government position, probably shouldn't be involved in that sort of thing. But we're not going to go into that. We're going to move on. Yeah. Dr. Dean Lorich, a surgeon who wrote an article expressing his disappointment with the medical response in Haiti after the earthquakes in 2010, voiced complaints regarding the Clinton Foundation in an email thread that was sent to Hillary Clinton by her chief of staff, Cheryl Mills. This email was released publicly by WikiLeaks. In December of 2017, Lorich was found dead in his New York apartment by apparent suicide. The police were called, and his daughter was there. The police were called by the doorman who reported an assault. Lorich is said to have stabbed himself in the chest and bled out. That is not how I'd kill myself. So wait, you need to elaborate more on his daughter was there. Is she like a young daughter? Did she yeah, see it young happen? daughter. Just that she was present. She was present. Okay. Lieutenant Quarles Harris Jr. was said to be a key witness in a passport case involving Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and John McCain. It's said that he worked for John Brennan, gained access to Obama's passport, and not long after was shot in the head in front of his church on April 19, 2008. So I want to improv add to this. So when Obama was running against McCain, you and I were at such odds mm -hmm. because you were a delegate for Obama and yep. I was supporting McCain mostly because I really liked his running mate, Sarah Palin. I remember liking Sarah Palin. I just didn't like John McCain. Yeah. So here's the thing that I didn't know about John McCain. Apparently, he had a lot of really deep ties to some real bad people people. And one of the aspects of the conspiracy that we don't even touch on in here, because I didn't feel like we really needed to get into it. But I'm going to get into it since you brought this up. I um, was reading. And so there was apparently a thing where there was four Taliban leaders who were killed in an attack. And it was reported as five Taliban leaders. And then that was mysteriously before John McCain died. And then part of the theory was that when he was buried, the flag on top of his coffin was wrinkled, which is the mark of a traitor. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. And I don't know if there's much truth behind it. I just read the theory, but it was one of the things that I stumbled across in here that I was like, <gasps> but I'm confused about your story. The Taliban leaders, there were five. Four there were four of them died. But when it was reported, it was reported as five. So there was a mystery person somewhere in there. John McCain was linked and then he was dead. But how was he linked to that? I didn't look into it. That's okay. what I just said. Okay. But that's just one of the little theories to go into the greater government involved with bad people thing. 
Okay. So anyway, that was a thing. So I'm Ooh. like, oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I almost made him president. No, I, we didn't even get close. But <laughs> no. I still have some commemorative materials, though. I don't. Like a can of John McCain hot chocolate. I got the same weird vibe from John McCain that I get from Joe Biden. Like just that weird, like, mm-mm. I never saw him actually sniff anybody. No, it was different. Like the symptoms of the vibe were different. The vibe was, ooh, the vibe itself was similar. But you got to trust your instincts on that stuff, man. Oh, that's why I was all like, I ain't doing it. So anyway, James Dolan, who was a military vet who had served in Fallujah in his second deployment, committed suicide as well as Aaron Swartz, who was said to have taken his own life after facing prosecution for an information hack and release. Please do some independent digging on these cases as well. Seth Rich, this is the one I'm super familiar with. Seth Rich. Uh, was shot twice in the back of the head while walking home on July 10th, 2016 in Washington, D.C. Nothing was stolen from his body, but he happens to be the one who leaked the DNC emails to WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, the ones written by Hillary Clinton, or that were hacked into her email. He hacked it, right? No, he just leaked it. He leaked it. Yep. But James Dolan and Aaron Swartz are also related to hacks and software. So anyway, they're also computer related. I didn't mention that when I read it. Okay. But later leaks are said to have revealed that a hit was put on Seth by Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And the reason that that was thought was that the emails used the term wet works, which is a um, like a slang term for like assassinations or murders or whatever. So Debbie Wasserman Schultz was a chair for the Democratic National Committee, a really high ranking one. She was up there. Big deal. So Richard Cousins, CEO of Clinton Late Compass Group, helped to build the Clinton Presidential Library in Little Rock, Arkansas. His son Will worked for Open Britain which is a group funded by George Soros. Both of them died in a plane crash the same day as Bruce Steinberg on January 1st in 2018. The body of journalist Jenny Moore was found in a D.C. hotel room in August of 2018, one month after providing evidence to the DHS and FBI concerning Bill Clinton raping children on a private yacht. Allegedly. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Joseph Rago, who wrote for the Wall Street Journal, was found dead in his home on July 20th of 2017, a day which he was set to meet a Russian consulate to get information on Hillary Clinton obtaining a Russian drug company. On July 7th, 2018, the New Jersey home of John and Carol Palladino suddenly exploded in a massive blast that shook the entire neighborhood. The week following their death, they were supposed to testify against Hillary in a court case related to medicinal price gouging. Michael Hastings was a journalist for the Rolling Stone and BuzzFeed, whose work included investigative pieces on corruption and illicit activities within the U.S. government agencies and institutions, in particular the U.S. Army, the Democratic Party, and then-President Barack Obama. The day before he died, Hastings sent an email to some colleagues saying that he was, quote, onto a big story, end quote, and that he needed to, quote, go off the radar, and that the FBI might be interviewing his colleagues. Sometime after midnight, on the night of his death, he asked his neighbor to borrow her Volvo, saying that he was afraid to drive his own car, but she said no. Around 4.25 a.m., his Mercedes crashed. CCTV video was made public, and in the video, the car is seen driving at a high speed and is sparking, and then appears to explode before hitting a palm tree. Witnesses apparently described the car's engine as having been inexplicably thrown about 60 yards away from the scene. Keith Coney, who was a witness set to testify on the Ives Henry case involving Bill Clinton and cocaine smuggling, died in a motorcycle accident while being chased down by a car in May of 1988. And so the Ives Henry case, Ives and Henry were both murdered in a case that was involving cocaine smuggling in which there were alleged links to Bill Clinton being involved when he was governor of, governor of Arkansas. Yep. So another witness in the Ives Henry case was Keith McCaskill. He had information pointing to the guy's death being murders to cover for Bill Clinton and Mina. He warned his family that he was being targeted and told them goodbye. On November 10th of 1988, he was stabbed to death a total of 113 times. Gregory Collins was also a witness to the murders of Don Henry and Kevin Ives, who had come forward with information but was murdered before he could testify. He was shot in the face in January of 1989. And that's not all, folks. James Milam was an informant 
in the cocaine cover-up run by Bill Clinton, allegedly, and was found dead in his home on May 10th of 1987. His death was ruled a suicide. It was said that he died apparently from an ulcer and his dog ate his entire head, but his head was found a few blocks away and it appeared to have been cut off by a knife, which is weird. Yeah, very weird. Jeff Rhodes was another witness in this case whose body was found in a landfill, shot in the head with his feet and hands almost sawn off, and then set on fire in April of 1989. I could go on, and I really could, because there are a lot of other witnesses here to this case who died, but I feel like you kind of get the point. During the Branch Davidian raid in Waco, Texas, four of Bill Clinton's bodyguards were the only ATF agents to die. This was on February 28, 1993. Conway LeBlue, Todd Todd McKeon, Steve Will and Robert Williams were all shot in the left temple, execution style, and examined by a private doctor. Probably by Lon Horiuchi. (laughs) Lon Horiuchi. Lon. (laughs) So there are also two helicopter crashes in different years and different situations, which involved private bodyguards of Bill Clinton as well. One in Germany and one in Virginia, which I found to be odd. Mm -hmm. If you want to follow that rabbit hole, Google the Clinton Deadpool or the Clinton body count. There is a link in our cited sources with a Twitter account, which laid out the list in an easy to read format in 2018. Thank you, Robert Horan or at Robbie12692. I emailed him. I want to be friends. He's an independent researcher. You have to talk louder. I said I emailed him and I want to be friends. (laughs) Very good. Fashion designer Kate Spade was involved in two Clinton Foundation projects and she was found hanging by a scarf in a hotel room. There was a lot of conspiracy rumors around her death as well as the death of Anthony Bourdain. I'm not going to get into too much detail on those stories because you can totally get lost in it and I don't want to get too diverted from the overall picture. I do encourage you to do your own digging. I really hope to get some emails, calls, and feedback about this type of information and other people's conclusions conclusions after their research. So don't let me down, y'all. So I have a bad feeling though. I've been on Reddit and there's a lot of anti-Q subreddits, which is fine. Which is fine. We go both ways here, like explaining all sides of the story or encourage you to look into all sides of the story. But I feel like we're going to get some hate because they are super mean, like so mean, but that's okay. And I stand by, if you find legitimate evidence that proves that this stuff is wrong, then you know, high five. It's and wrong. Post it to our Facebook. Tell us why it's wrong. Yeah, give us some good sources because we we really do like to dig into all sides of this. It's not something that you jump into head first and just, you know, become a cultist with a Q. No, ultimately, we want to know the truth. Truth seekers Wherever here. Wherever it leads. But there's been so much talk about this and it's so way too much of a coincidence, all these things tied together, that it does make you wonder a lot about if there's something more going on here. And who knows whether they're all actually linked to one huge dark evil entity or if they're all coincidence, truly, and not linked and it's just a bunch of bad shit happening around a bunch of people. Very unfortunate politicians, right? Who keep losing all of their friends and bodyguards and witnesses. So also don't forget about the Hollywood pedogate issue, which is also very much in the public eye, but we're not going to cover it. This is truly the very bare bones, skin deep surface of the pen- phenomena. Phenomena that phenomena. is... <laughs> that is Q. Oh, yeah. I wanted to talk about one more extreme idea that a few followers of Q and on hold, which is the idea that Robert Kennedy Jr. faked his death in a plane crash to avoid assassination and is planning to come back as the great unifier. They call it the return of the king. And Q actually has blatantly told them that this is not true on a 4chan post. So I guess we'll hold our breath for that plot twist. Well, and then there was one argument that when Q posted, well, somebody said, is John Kennedy Jr. going to come back? And Q said, no. Because he passed away. But the theory on that was John Kennedy Jr. is no longer a junior. Oh. Oh. So maybe it's a diversion. (laughs) We'll just have to wait and see, I guess. I'm holding my breath. I want to know. Watch him. Watch him. Okay. You. What is it? Who are you to deny the return of the king? (laughs) Anyway, so there's a very brief and abbreviated rundown on the thought process and the breadcrumb trail explaining why these scandals can be linked together as far as independent researchers are concerned. This is referred to as the Q map as laid out by Dylan Lewis Monroe. Which is is my screensaver, by the way. (laughs) It is intricate. It is all encompassing. And it is hard to read. 
No. <laughs> if you look at it long enough, it's easy to read. <laughs> but it does inspire one to think about things. There is also a Q clock that you can look into if you're interested in digging deeper for your own curiosity. Ultimately, Q is summarized by its followers as a symbol of hope for a better world through the downfall of essentially an evil empire that is secretly running the world. The movement is marked by phrases like the calm before the storm, draining the swamp, future proves past, follow the white rabbit, those who know cannot sleep, trust the plan united we stand divided we fall and my personal favorite where Where we we go go one we we go go all we like the idea of hope we like the idea behind the great awakening as it pertains to general public becoming more aware of the greater processes that govern them and coming together uniting as a society and the concept of a great new world we're definitely dreamers here at bf4b but as always we maintain our ever-present level of skepticism So there you have it. Thanks for listening to this week's episode, and I hope we don't get disappeared from the internet for using some of the Q terms and stuff, because another thing that I did find while trying to research both pro and against viewpoints is that a lot of pro QAnon sources have been removed from search engine results, and they've been demonetized. So... There's that. Thank you again for listening to Bigfoot for Breakfast and once again following us down the rabbit hole. Keep listening as we continue to spiral down through various mysteries of the universe. If you want to contact us for any reason, shoot us an email at bigfootforbreakfast at outlook.com, send us a Facebook message, or post on our wall. We love memes. Let's get interactive, so send us some memes. You can also follow us on Instagram and send us a message on there as well. Also, you can leave us a voicemail and let us know what you think of the show and we'll play it on a future episode. The number for that is 641-812-2635. Adios. Bye. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Before we buy, we have a contest. Go we do right have now. a contest. And we forgot to mention it to begin with. We'll put it on our Facebook also. If you mention us on any social media website, just tag us in it. Recommend us if you feel like it. You'll be entered automatically in a drawing to win a free Bigfoot for Breakfast t-shirt or a coffee mug. And don't forget to tag us so that we know you did it. See you next week.